it was springtime in the Rockies, the Canadian Rockies, that is, and all the marigolds were in bloom. People would come from miles around to see the marigolds. All the people except Dudley Durright. He was allergic to marigolds. Salute, goes on tight. It's these marigolds. I, I can't stand them. Allergic, eh? Well, that's too bad, Dudley, too bad. <laughs> You see this package, Roma? Quick blowing marigold. I didn't know you went into the horticulture, Snidely. I don't. What I'm going to do is plant them on my suit. Oh. Did you say plant them on your suit? Yes, Homer. And by morning, I'll have a full crop of marigolds. On your suit? That's right, Homer. A marigold Snidely suit. Now, hand me the peat moss. I know I should never have got that subscription to Better Homes and Gardens. What you don't understand is that Dudley Do-Right is allergic to marigolds. With his suit, I will be invincible. And so, the next day... How do I look, Homer? You look just like a float in a rose parade. Meanwhile, at the mountain camp... Dudley, will you walk with me? The marigolds are in bloom. I'm sorry, Dell. I have something else to do. Well, how could I tell her that Dudley Do Right of the Bounties is allergic to marigolds? Good thing you're here, Do Right. All the other Mounties are out looking at the marigold Snidely Whiplash in town, boasting that he's not afraid of you, Dudley, and that he'll meet you any time you're ready. What's that, Inspector? Why I'll ride into town at once and break him in. Not ride, Dudley. Walk. Your horse is looking at the marigolds with nails. So Dudley walked to town to bring Snidely in. <laughs> Stidely Whiplash, I arrest you in the name of... There, what did I tell you? Dudley do right is scared to death of me. Listen, Dudley, everyone in town is saying you ran away from Snidely Whiplash, that you were scared to death. Well, I won't have it. Gives the mountains a bad name. Now, I want you to go right back into town and not come back till you bring him in. And that is an order. So Dudley tried bandaging his nose, hoping in this way not to breathe the deadly fumes of the marigolds. And with his bandaged nose, Dudley didn't breathe in the fumes of the marigolds. Dudley couldn't breathe at all. Help! 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 Dudley tried a gas mask, but that didn't work either. Help! Help! What is the matter, Dudley? Is it because I took your horse to see the marigolds? Don't mention the word marigold to me, Dell. <laughs> I'm allergic to them. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people are allergic. But I'm not people, Dell. I'm a Mountie. And besides, Snidely Whiplash is wearing a marigold suit. A marigold suit? I can't get within two feet of him. Well, who would want to? But you don't understand. I've got to bring him in or the inspector won't let me back in the camp. Listen, Dudley, I have a plan. I'll sneak over to Snidely Shack and plant some crabgrass on his marigold suit. Do you think it'll work? You know what crabgrass does to marigolds. Did you water me suit, Omar? I left the sprinklers on for 15 minutes, like you said. I did it, Dudley. I planted Snidely's suit with crabgrass. The next morning, however, there was no crabgrass growing on Snidely's suit. Go ahead, Dudley. Take him. But now the marigolds are still there. There's no crabgrass at all. Well, that's funny. I planted the crabgrass. I used fertilizer. Oops, I forgot to water it. But don't worry, I'll fix that. Well, my allergy is gone. Well, now all you have to do is cut through the crabgrass in Snidely is yours. I'm halfway through the crabgrass, and I still haven't found Snidely. Well, keep at it. He's bound to be in there someplace. That was close, Homer. Are you going to plant some more marigolds in your suit, Snidely? No, Homer. Snidely doesn't seem to be there at all, Nell. Dudley, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think that's Snidely. Uh. Poor Snidely. Inspector, Inspector, I brought in Snidely Whiplash. Where? In that bag. Ugh. Dudley, that's not Snidely Whiplash. That's a bag full of crabgrass. And I'm very allergic to crabgrass. <laughs> but, Inspector... Oh, come on, Dudley. He'd never believe us anyway. <laughs> for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two. And now here's a feature you're sure to like.
keep that up, young fella, and you'll wake the whole neighborhood. Watch out, Pop. He's liable to sink his teeth in you. Junior, apparently you've forgotten one of my most frequently quoted proverbs. Which one is that, Pop? Barking dogs seldom bite. <laughs> well, barking big dogs seldom bite, which paves the way very nicely to my fable entitled The Hound and the Wolf. Once there was a pasture filled with the most edible grass you ever saw. And when you have a pasture with edible grass, you usually have a flock of sheep. Unfortunately, the sheep are also edible, especially to a pack of wolves. Last today, Gus. Wednesday. That's what I thought. We have mutton on Wednesday, do we not? Usually. Then let us have at them edible sheep. And just like that, the wicked scavengers trotted up to the flock. Although this particular flock had no shepherd to guard them, they did have a sheepdog. Mauler was his name, and for a very good reason. <laughs> Cotton picking wolves. Now, this entire scene had been witnessed by another wolf who had a reputation for being the craftiest in the world. I think I will decimate yonder sheepdog and then partake of a lamb dinner. As you can see, this wolf was not the slightest bit afraid of sheepdogs. And why should he be? He never fought them tooth and claw, he used a fencing foil. On guard, eh, sheepdog. Ordinarily, that was enough to send the guardian of the flock to greener fire hydrants. But Mauler had a row of molars that didn't know the meaning of the word fear. Without his foil, the wolf was helpless. Cotton-picking wolves. Cotton-picking fencing wolves. Mauler returned to his chores, and at sundown, after he had locked up the flock, headed for home. Unknown to him, he had a shadow. No sheepdog can do what he did to me and get away with it. Inside his split-level thatched hut, Mauler sat down to a plate of bone, hard bone at that. Hmm, I, I guess I'll have to gum my way through. So saying, he removed that formidable row of molars. Hey, they're store boughten That was all the wolf needed to know. He would swipe the teeth, and the sheep would be defenseless. Good afternoon, sir. I'd like to get your opinion on a new soft drink. What's it called? Sheepdog Cola. Actually, it was nothing more than a concentrated dose of knockout drops. Don't listen to him, baby. Go ahead, take a slug, and let me know what you think. <coughs> well? Uh, well, which? How do you feel? I feel fine. You don't feel sick? No, my gums itch. How about sleep? You feel sleepy? Not the least. Hmm, must be something wrong. <laughs> Two nights later, after sleeping it off in Battle Creek, Michigan, the wolf returned to the thatched hut. Quick, quick, there's a starving tiger out there with a T-bone steak, and it's so tough he can't chew it. That's awful. Those were my words exactly. What could I do to help? Have you got any false teeth he can chew with? Just those over on the table. They'll do fine. Hey, wait a minute. You said there was a tiger out there. There are no tigers around here. Did I say tiger? I meant a three-toed sloth. No, three-toed sloth is around here either. That's sleeve. Plural of sloth is sleep. Oh, what do you have around here? Uh, just sheep, dogs, and wolves. Well, one of them is out there with a tough T-bone. Then give him my brand new steak knife. Yeah. You know, you got tolerance. That's what you got. And you know something? That wolf was so overcome with the dog's generosity, he actually believed his story was true. Hold on! I'm coming! One week later, the wolf gave it another try. Merry Christmas, sheepdog. Santa Claus. He knows me. Oh, what are you going to give me, sheepdog? Give you? You usually do the giving. Well, it's been a tough winter, kid. Well, I'll be happy to give you some, Santa. Anything in particular you would like? Yeah, false teeth. But if I give you my false teeth, I would not be able to protect the sheep. Yeah, well, that's the way Christmas is sometimes. The crafty wolf was about to grab the teeth when a noise came from the fireplace and... Merry Christmas! Santa Claus! A ringer. But if you are Santa, then who is... Needless to say, the wolf beat a hasty retreat. But not so hasty that he didn't take the time to swipe the teeth. Bright and early the next day, the wolf boldly approached the flock. Sheep, you and I are having lunch together. <laughs> Don't <laughs> me, sheepdog. You ain't got no teeth, so you can't bite me. I'm taking this fat little lamb. True, Mauler couldn't bite, but the fat little lamb could. <laughs> That wolf took off, never to be seen again. Oh, I didn't know lambs had teeth like that, Pop. Well, you see, son, this particular flock was owned by a dentist. He had fitted them all with false teeth. So that's why I say barking dogs seldom bite. I got a better one. Nothing dentured, nothing gained. Nothing just... Um, how about a glass of sheepdog cola, son? And here's Bowwinkle Corner. Hello, 
Little Bear. Time again for a small belt of culture. Today's poem is a searching character study called Simple Simon. Simple Simon met a pieman going to the fair. Said Simple Simon to the pieman, let me taste your ware. My what? What you what, your ware. Let me taste your ware. What ware? I got no ware. You know what ware? Anywhere. Who's got ware? You got ware. I don't got ware. Ask her, maybe she's got ware. Who's she? She's witch. Witch? Yes, see if she's got ware. What ware? Witches ware. What? No ware. What's no ware? This whole poem. Why don't you start over? Because I can't quit till I get a pie. A pie? You said where? Same thing. Your pies are your wares. Oh, why didn't you say so? Here is pie. That's better. Better? Sure. Now I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> Canada, at the close of the 19th century, the Mounties undaunted continue their pursuit of the most wanted man in Canada, Snidely Whiplash. And his most eager pursuer was acting corporal Dudley Do-Right. Stop Snidely Whiplash in the name of the law! <laughs> oh, shucks, I wasn't that good. Of course you were. Can't you hear that applause? Now get out there and take another bow. You too there. What a team, what a team! What do you call your team? Well, I'm Dudley Do-Right, and this here is Snidely Whiplash. Do-Right and Whiplash, only terrific. What a team. When you said stop in the name of the law, I thought I'd die laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I just think those things up off the top of my head. Oh, we've got to have you racked in this show. We'll accept on one condition. What's that? That I get top billing. Not Do-Right and Whiplash, but Whiplash and Do-Right. I always knew you were a villain, Whiplash, but I never thought you were a ham. <laughs> I never thought you were a ham. Funny. Well, is it all right with you. Well, I suppose so, the big ham. Anything for the theater? Okay, be back at eight sharp for the evening performance. And a little while later at Mounty headquarters. So that's the way it is, Inspector Fenwick. I'll have to resign from the force. It's the footlights for me. From now on, I'm in showbiz. Dudley, think it over. The theater isn't the life for you. Living out of a trunk, eating in cheap restaurants, and teamed up with, of all people, snidely whiplash. The boy's got talent, Inspector. But... I'm sorry, sir. The theater's in my blood. I must leave you now for... Ta-da! The show must go on. And at the same time in Whiplash's hideout... You in show business? Oh, come on, Whiplash. But you don't understand, Homer. They gave me top billing. Yeah, but you're Besides, not... Besides, this gives me an opportunity to get rid of Dudley Do right once and for all. How's that, Snidely? Come to the performance and you'll see. <laughs> Which reminds me, I must be going for... Ta-da! The show must go on. What a ham. Nell Fenwick happened to be strolling by the theater that night and... One ticket, please. Oh, Mr. Durag. Yes, Mr. Whiplash. You have a complexion just like a peach. I have a complexion just like a peach. How's that, Mr. Whiplash? It's all pink and fuzzy. <laughs> oh, Mr. Durag. Yes, Mrs. Whipsmash. When does July come before June? In the dictionary. <laughs> Snidely Whiplash is making a laughing stuff out of you. Come back with me to the Royal Canadian Mounted Bully. What? And give up show business? Yay! That's just the thing this act needs. Class, did you rehearse that bit? Why, no. I, I mean... A method actress, huh? Know what I'm gonna do with you? I'm gonna put you in the act. Whiplash, do right and... Uh, uh, what's your name, baby? Fenwick. Fenwick. Whiplash, do right and Fenwick. I'll do it on one condition. Anything. I get top billing. Oh, gee, now. Hmm. Fenwick, Whiplash and do right. Songs, dancing and funny business. Funny business, all right. To think that the name Fenwick would be degraded, dragged in the mud. Well, I should put a stop to it. Oh, Mr. Durai. Yes, Miss Fenwick. Why does a fireman wear red suspenders? You have me there, Miss Fenwick. Why does a fireman wear red suspenders? You hold his pants up. <laughs> Caught you, Snidely Whiplash. Curses! Foiled again. Oh, Nell, little Nell, how could you? I mean, you are a Fenwick after all. Going into show business? Oh, yes, but, Father, don't you see? It was just a trick. And now... Ta-da! I have captured art villain Snidely Whiplash for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Yay! That's what the acne, the fat man. 
really? Was I really good? Only terrific. Well, I did do a little acting in high school. I remember I was second lead in the desert song. One on arm to be my arm. But, Father, I have caught Aunt Villain Snidely Whiplash. Stop trying to upstage me, girl. Can't you see this is my big chance at last? One on arm to be my arm. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? I'm up my sleeve. Bristol! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. ago, there was a year that was a mighty bad year for witches. They were everywhere, big ones, little ones, ugly ones, and uglier ones. In fact, there were so many that there just weren't enough people to go around to cast spells upon. Let go! I want to put him to sleep for a hundred years! You let go! I'm going to change him into a chicken! But I saw him first! You did not! It got so bad that even the witches couldn't tell which witch was which. Then one day, as a little witch was searching the forest for a victim... If I don't find somebody to cast a spell on pretty soon, I'll... Then suddenly, the witch saw a little frog sitting on a log near a pond. Well, well, what have we here? We have a frog. What have we there? I'm a witch. That figures. And I'm going to cast a spell on you. Oh, come now. I'm already a frog. What else could you do to me? But the witch was desperate, and with a wave of her hand, she changed the frog into a handsome young prince. <laughs> oh, boy, that... That felt good. Hey, what's the big idea? I don't want to be a handsome prince. I was happy as a frog. Well, I admit it isn't the kind of a spell we usually cast, but times are hard. Ta-ta, dearie. <laughs> the young prince went back to the log and squatted down where he used to sit as a frog and dreamed of catching flies, but somehow... It just wasn't the same. He even tried a few croaks. Me, 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 me. Uh, uh, sugar rump A uh, sugar rump But it was no use. He knew that if he was ever to be happy again, he must find the witch and make her change him back into a frog. Well, it's like they say. You can take the frog out of the pond, but you can't take the pond out of the frog. So the young man set off in search of the witch, and after several hours of stumbling through the woods, he stumbled into a castle. This particular castle was owned by a king who had a very beautiful but unmarried daughter. Why don't you get a husband? They're all frogs or something these days. This young man who just walked through our wall doesn't look like a frog. Oh, are you a handsome young prince? No, I'm a handsome young frog. See? No, 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 the boy is just a little mixed up. What he needs is a wife, say, uh, like you. So, despite the young prince's protests, they were married. They were very happy and had everything except a home. But, dearest, do all brides have to live in a pond? They do if their husband is a frog, and where are those flies I asked you to catch me? But if I don't get a real house of my own pretty soon, I'll just die. The young frog prince finally gave in and built her a beautiful cottage. Then one day, when he was in the yard casing a June bug, a witch came by. Oh, goody! A handsome young prince! Probably the last one left in the kingdom, and he's all mine! <laughs> I'll change him into a... Uh, <laughs> frog? Good idea! A frog it will be. That night, at the dinner table... You know, honey, you've insisted that you're a frog for so long that you're even beginning to look like one. But I keep telling you I am a frog, and if we don't move back to the pond, I'll just die. Just then, the little witch, who had originally cast a spell upon him, came by and was amazed to see that he'd returned to a frog. Mighty strange. Usually when I prince them, they stay princed. Well, I'll try again. Only this time, he was changed into a chicken. Well, that did it. 
And deciding that it was time to call a halt to such nonsense, he angrily stormed into the witch's union where he confronted the head witch. Now look, first I was a frog, then a prince, and now I'm a chicken. I've had enough King's ex. Okay, I'll change you back to whatever you say. What would you like to be? Be a prince, honey. Yeah, a prince. So be it. Here, prince. Nice prince. Not that kind of a prince. Oh, sorry. But try as she would, the old witch couldn't change him into a prince, so she finally returned him to a frog. Whew. I'm sorry, dearie, but uh, you've been bewitched so much that I just can't make a prince out of you. The poor frog was confused and very sad. He turned to his wife and said, Will you still love me even though I'm just a frog? Well... Chug the rump! Yes. And with that, they both hopped back to the pond where they sat on a mossy rock and exclaimed, If, if we, we have, have to stay, stay frogs for the rest, rest of our lives, we'll, we'll just die. die. Of course, they didn't die, but you can rest assured that they croaked every night. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Crystal! Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. The month was June in the Canadian Northwest, and once again, Dudley Do-Right's heart Turn to Nell. Nell, 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 Nell. Your name sounds like the ringing of a bell. Oh, Dudley, I know my name sounds just like a bell, but is that enough? A pretty name, a pretty face. But while I stay here and do the household chores, you go out into the world where there's excitement, adventure. But, Nell, that's the way things are. That's Mountie business. We always get our man. How about women? How's that? Do you always get your women? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Of course you don't. Women are too smart for you. Besides, if you do always get your man, why is Snidely Whiplash still at large? It will take some doing, but I'll bring him in. Ha! But? I said ha! And then Snidely and all his henchmen was no trouble at all. <laughs> all right, Dudley, you change places with me and I will show you. Well, I... All right. Homer, do you know why I can get away with all my nefarious mischief? I don't even know what nefarious mischief means. Because I am not one jump ahead of Dudley Do-Right. I am eight jumps ahead of Dudley Do-Right, but that's to be expected of anyone who has a hyphenated last name. Snidely! Snidely! They have replaced Dudley Do-Right on a Mountie. with another Mountie. How can you be sure? Because there was the strange Mountie riding on a horse. We must work fast, Homer. <laughs> we must put a cordon of our most trustworthy henchmen around the shack. Right! What's a cordon? Life moves in mysterious ways. This morning I was Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties. This afternoon, Dudley Do-Right, homemaker. Oh, Nell, after you finish sweeping in here, could you tidy up my office? Oh, and another thing. I think you're seeing altogether too much of Dudley Do-Right. Were well, you even beginning to look like him a little? Inspector Fenwick, I am not your daughter, Nell Fenwick. I am Dudley Do-Right. Then what are you doing in that funny apron? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Nell has switched places with me. She is out trying to bring in her man, and I'm doing the housework. Bring in her man? Don't you know what this means? A thing like this could lead to woman's suffering. But when Nell reached Whiplash, his hideout, she found it well guarded. <laughs> Why don't you boys come up to the RCMP camp and see me sometime? Wow! Well, Inspector, you know what we all go through to get our man. Nell hasn't a ghost of a chance to get her man. Not a ghost of a chance, eh? And now, Snidely Whiplash. We must stop Nell from bringing in Snidely Whiplash. If she brings in Snidely, uh. there'll be no stopping her. She may become the first woman Prime Minister of the Commonwealth. What in the world has happened to my cordon? Where have my men gone? They all went off with Dudley's replacement. Put up quite a fight, did they? No, they seem to go willingly. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, you better do it fast, because here he comes now. I know what I'm going to do. What any red-blooded villain would do, hide. Snidely Whiplash, give yourself up in the name of the mounted police. <laughs> Nell Fenwick. Come along now, Whiplash. You are my prisoner. Uh, no, Nell, I think you have that a little twisted, the way it looks now. You you are my prisoner. Oh, but Snidely, don't you see? I have to make good. I... This is my big chance. And now you won't come with me. I 
can't stand to see a woman cry. Stop it, Nell. I'll go along with you. She caught him, Dudley. Oh, we've got to help Snidely escape. Psst, Snidely. No, thanks. It's no use, Dudley. Snidely's petrified with fear. But I have a plan. All I ask is that you agree with everything I say when we get back to camp. Dudley, father, I did it. I brought in Snidely Whiplash like I said I would. Where is he, Nell? Why, right here, father. I don't see Snidely Whiplash. Do you, Dudley? Why, yes, sir, Inspector Fenwick. He's right over. Oh! Are you quite sure, do right, that you see Snidely Whiplash? No, Inspector, I can't see anything. Well, Nell, you can see for yourself. <laughs> Dudley can't see Snidely Whiplash, I can't see Snidely Whiplash, so we may presuppose that Snidely Whiplash is a figment of your imagination. Well, Nell, I tried. Father, that figment of my imagination is about to blow up the RCMP camp. That's right, Nell. Figment did blow up this camp. Hairy Figment. Dudley, I want you to bring this hairy Figment in at once. Yes, sir, Inspector. Hairy Figment? And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never worked. This time for sure. Presto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. A question, Chairman. Where is Toronto? Out on the reservation with the Lone Ranger, Mr. Peabody. <laughs> You're close. Actually, Toronto is in Canada, and that is our destination for today. What great name in history are we going to meet up there? Constable Archibald Woolley. Never heard of him. He was the first Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman. I instructed Sherman to set the Wayback Machine for the year 1869. The place, an outpost in the Wilderness Territory of Toronto. And before you could say, halt or I'll shoot, we were standing inside the post headquarters watching a very irate Constable Woolley. What's the matter, Mr. Peabody? He's tearing the place to pieces. Uh, looking for something, Constable? Yes, by George, a new job. You mean you're quitting the Mounties? Yes, the whole thing's a bust. For my very first case, I'm supposed to bring in Ottawa O'Toole. Well, bring him in. I can't. Why not? Because of our motto, we always get our man. Ottawa O'Toole is a girl. Well, I convinced the constable that girl or no girl, Ottawa O'Toole had to be brought in. Following up the latest information as to her whereabouts, we arrived at the Pettigrew Fur Company, only to find it in a complete state of disorder and a going out of business sign over the main gate. Trouble here, Pettigrew? Trouble ain't the word for it. Ottawa O'Toole struck again. She's ruined me. What did she do this time? She crossed all my minks with skunks. Now my business stinks. One good thing came of all this. O'Toole had left a very clear trail. Hoping to head her off before she could commit another atrocity, Constable Woolley took off, but didn't get very far, for Miss O'Toole had set a booby trap. Yes, and she caught a booby, too. Undaunted, we picked up the trail anew and followed it to the edge of a dense forest of mighty Saskatchewan spruce. There, on a tree, was a wanted poster. Look, Sherman. Wanted! Ottawa O'Toole and her two sisters, Hermione and Gingold. This unfortunately gave the constable an idea. If only I could find two ladies and talk them into posing as O'Toole's sisters, I'd put them in jail, and when she came to break them out, I'd have her. Unfortunately, ladies were hard to come by in the wilderness, so the constable did what he considered to be the next best thing. How come I have to wear a bonnet, Mr. Peabody? Because most girls don't have cowlick, Sherman. We were locked up in the nearest jail and awaited developments which were soon to come. As Constable Woolley had figured, Otto O'Toole took the bait. Look, Hermione, a rock with a note tied to it. Suppressing the urge to throttle Sherman, I instead read the note. Sisters, I will take care of the Mountie and have you out in a jiffy, signed Ottawa. Hmm, it seems as though she means the constable bodily harm. Yeah, we better warn him. Constable, come here, hurry. Be with you in a moment, summoned at the door. But that's what we want to... Good evening, madam. We're still locked up. How's she going to get us out? Just then there was a tap at the window. A hand thrust its way through the bars and dropped a long, thin object at Sherman's feet. A burning candle, Mr. Peabody. That is not a candle. Are you sure? Positive. 
When we came to, we were trussed up in the back of a speeding duckboard, heading into a remote area. Our driver was obviously the fiendishly clever Ottawa. Also, obviously, she had discovered the ruse and was out to dispose of us. I'm awful hungry, Mr. Peabody. Mind if I eat my jelly beans? What jelly beans? I ripped a hole in your pocket, and you've been dropping them at the rate of three beans per quarter mile. What did you do that for? To provide a trail for Constable Woolley. Sure enough, a scant 400 feet behind was the redoubtable Constable, not only following the trail, but eating it as well. It was almost sundown when Ottawa O'Toole brought the buckboard to a stop at the edge of a lofty precipice. How come she's stopping here, Mr. Peabody? Obviously, she intends to push the buckboard and us over. But before she could do so... Ottawa O'Toole, you're under arrest. Go to work, Mr. Constable. Tie her up. I can't do it. We always get our man, not our woman. This isn't cricket. O'Toole would have escaped had it not been for my superior powers of deduction. So grabbing a nearby rock... You can't hit a lady, Mr. Peabody. She's no lady, Sherman. The disgrace of it all, capturing a woman instead of a man. Ah, but you did get your man. Observe. Otto O'Toole was a man disguised as a woman. Bravo! Hear, hear, and all that, Tommy Rout. Gee, how did you know Otto was a man? Because she had five o'clock shadow at 3.30. That Constable Woolley sure is a great policeman. Very true, but he became even a better actor. He did? I never heard of him as an actor. Well, of course you have, Sherman. Surely everybody's heard of Mounty Woolley. Fans, today's topic is entitled, How to do stunts in the movies, without having the usher throw you out. You arrive at the studio and get the first assignment from the director. You all set to go, stuntmen? I sure am, Stevie. Here is scene. You start car, car blows up. With me in it? Absolutely, of course not. We stop film, you get out, then car blows up. Got it? Got it. Camera, action. Thank you. War pictures offer a great challenge to the stuntman, especially if you're chicken. Comes now big bombing scene. Dommy is in foxhole. Bombs fall all around. You rush into foxhole, get Dommy. Got it, PW. Camera, action. Right out onto no man's land you run. Bombs busting to the right and to the left. Somehow you make it, leap into the foxhole, fight off the foxes, and emerge with the dummy, which is a bomb. And you are the dummy. <laughs> Before the day is through, you find yourself on a 5,000-foot high cliff. In this scene, you jump off cliff into net. Comforted by the thought of the safety net below, you launch yourself earthward. The net is there, all right, but no one is holding it. And so in conclusion, to be a stuntman, one must always be careful to avoid painful injury. Thank you, Mr. Know-it-all. You're welcome. <laughs> Snidely Whiplash, that scandalous, nefarious, odious, obnoxious, villainous villain of the Northwest had outdone himself. He had become so shockingly despicable that he couldn't stand himself. You are rotten to the core, Snidely Whiplash. Rotten, rotten, rotten! How did I ever get started tying ladies to railroad tracks? If I could only stop, but I can't stop. I've got this thing! I've always told you, Dudley, that Snidely Whiplash was a bad A. Yes, you have, Inspector. Well, I have invented a Snidely catching machine. And it's a beauty. How does it work, Inspector? Well, you see this dummy woman here next to the railroad track? Yes. Well, Snidely isn't going to be able to resist trying to tie her to the railroad tracks. He has a thing about that. So what will happen? Try it, Dudley. All right. Oh, 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 oh. Board, board. Why don't you go read a book? Is that all you can tell me? Go read a book? Well. Sometimes, Dudley, I don't think you realize just how hard it is being inspector of the RCMP, having to constantly make decisions, decisions, decisions. Could you make a decision about getting me out of this thing? Nell took her father's advice and did read a book. In fact, she read hundreds of books. And since the only books the RCMP had were books on law, Nell developed a fabulous legal mind. Meanwhile, Inspector Fenwick and Dudley put their Snidely catching machine.
machine to work. You don't know how I hate myself for doing this, but I've got this thing about tying ladies to railroad tracks. Oh, Inspector Fenwick, you don't know how happy you've made me. I've been a fiend. If I'd kept it up, who knows where I would have ended. Release that man. What? You've got no habeas corpus, and by judicature, this man has right to bail. I've told you, Nell, about using language like that. There'll be no profanity here. I am here to see that justice is administered. Please, Nell, really, I'm better off here. I'm a lady-tying fiend. Aha! Uh -huh. Forced you into admitting that, eh? What did they use, a rubber hose? Well, well, never mind. It will never stand up in court, Whiplash. In, in court? court? Oh, confound you, Dudley, standing there with your placid, noble face. We may lose this case. I may have a placid, noble face, Inspector Fenwick, but just how can we win it? Let me ask you this, Dudley. How do you fight logic? Well... By superior deception. Deception, sir, but we're the good guys. Superior deception. Now, I'll be the prosecuting attorney and you'll be the judge. Don't you see, Do-Right? We can't help but get a conviction. But, sir, is that playing it the Canadian way? Order, order in the court. Will everyone please rise? Prosecutor, are you prepared to state your case? I am, Your Honor. Defense attorney, are you prepared to state your case? I am, Your Honor. And so Inspector Fenwick brought forth witness after witness, professing to the nefarious, odious, obnoxious, villainous character of Snidely Whiplash. And every time Nell Fenwick tried to object... I object, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Her objection was overruled. It looked like an open and shut case. Everyone in the courtroom knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Snidely Whiplash was as good as behind bars. But then, Nell spoke. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've come to speak not of the man you see before you, charged with a heinous crime of tying little old ladies to railroad tracks, but of Snidely Whiplash, that little Canadian boy running through the Canadian forests with no mother or father to take care of him, all alone, whose only pastime was to tie the mountain daisies together and to decorate the little forest animals, for they, ladies and gentlemen, were his friends. Tying things became a mania with him. He started to tie all sorts of things. Boy Scout knots, Boy Scouts, and finally, ladies to the railroad tracks. Your Honor, we know tying ladies to railroad tracks is wrong, but who's to blame? If we could have guided this poor barefoot boy, his only friend, a bunch of wild daisies, where would he have been today? Ladies and gentlemen, that barefoot boy is not on trial here today. You are. Well, Oh, Nell, you're right. We are to blame. I find that barefoot boy over there not guilty. You mean I'm free to go? Yes, idly, but one thing. Yes, Your Honor. When you're running through the Canadian forest... Yes, Your Honor. Pick a daisy for me. <laughs> Continue the fun. Build your own collection of The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yes, the spirit of Moose Mania is everywhere and has everyone running, riding, or rocketing to collect all six video volumes. I see you got yours. Yes, incredibly, there are six volumes in all. Oh, boy, have you forgotten the plot again? In a word, you said it. That's three words. I'm a heavy tipper. More of Rocky and Bullwinkle's hilarious gang of outrageous comic characters. More of that misguided Dudley do right of the Mounties. More of that dastardly duo Boris and Natasha. And still more of those slightly askew fractured fairy tales. Yes, for those who grew up watching them, for those who never outgrew them. Yes, yes. And for those who are growing to love them, what more could you possibly ask for than Mona Moose, Birth of Bullwinkle, Vincent Van Moose, Blue Moose, La Grande Moose, and Canadian Gothic. The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Once you collect one, you'll just have to have them all.